I'm being paid well, I've hit six figures, I've got, you know, I've got, I've got what a lot of people would consider like a successful life on paper. Why would I risk that? All right, welcome back to the Wits Podcast. We have got, once again, a wicked episode today with the one and only Rob G in the house, international DJ, uh, producer, corporate HR, people and culture uh, executive. And today you are an executive coach specifically focused around entrepreneurs, helping them scale and grow their business, define who their values are, figure out what they want, figure out how to plan, uh, figure out how to get there, and more importantly, sustain success. So Rob, your story is wicked. What was it like to transition from being this like super, I'm gonna call you a superstar DJ, uh, and music producer, in the scene, making music, partying, flying around the world, rocking the stage. How did it feel or what was that transition like going from that sort of to now corporate HR, people and culture? There's huge pressure anytime you make one of those big life transitions. And I felt it for sure because what happens once you are doing something for an ongoing basis and it's the way that you're paid, and it's the way that people see you and you start to believe that you are this person, this identity that you fabricated becomes you and it, it's very difficult to split the two. When I left music to um, go back into doing different pursuits, I had people that were mad at me. I, had, I have Facebook messages of people like, you can't quit DJing, that's who you are. I think someone said, like, that's how I see you, I think is how they said it because in their life I had provided this role where I was sharing music, making music, DJing events they enjoyed, so um, huge pressure there. It's the same thing when I left when I, an earlier job um, to help my business, my partner launch her business and to really focus on music again. That time I was at a, an accounting company, at a really well-known multinational accounting company, and I had several people pull me aside and say, that sounds risky. Are you sure about this? That sounds really dangerous. And I remember the first couple of people threw me off because they're so well-meaning, and their intentions were golden. They were looking out for me. Uh, but then I had to just kind of do the audit that the bigger risk for me would be to, if I had not tried it, and to have this kind of what if. Uh, and then with this most recent transition, for sure, because there's the, again, like I'm being paid well, I've hit six figures, I've got, you know, I've got, I've got what a lot of people would consider like a successful life on paper. Why would I risk that? Um, and it's definitely, um, you have to shed these things. You have to like question these labels, these identities, these projected expectations, some of them are your own, some of them are from other people. Um, and I know for other people it's difficult because they'll have really um, overbearing parents or a partner or someone like in their life that won't you know, let them, and I'm doing air quotes right now if you're listening to the audio, they won't let them. Um, and you, you have to be willing to, to like push against that and ask some tough questions. And again, for me it was, what if I didn't try this? I, wouldn't, I didn't want to risk that. So. Yeah, and I think you hear that a lot with anyone that's hit success, which is they had to take that leap of faith. They had to, they had to make the shift of the transition against the pressure of people's opinions, uh, and in some regards, the lens that they see you through. Talk to me more about that. I mean, when was that moment of clarity for you? What did it take? What did it not take? How hard was it to sort of switch transition? Having children is a really big wake-up call as far as trying to, to understand what your responsibility is in the world. And with my eldest, there was a moment where she was I, a year old, a year and a half old. She had barely any words in her vocabulary. And I was really hungover, was out too late the night before, and I was alone with her, and I was hugging the toilet all day. And I have this terrible, terrible memory of me hugging the toilet and her rubbing my back with the very few words she had in her vocabulary telling me, it's KK Papa, and it's gonna be KK Papa. Um, which led me to, to, for the first time, to stop drinking. I didn't drink, I think I took a three month break there. And it was a wake up call. But the challenge that you were alluding to, the sex, drugs, and rock and roll, is that it, it is late nights. My office is a nightclub, and it is an environment where it is encouraged, the, the drinking, the drugs, the, and especially where the level is at, where I was lucky enough to get to travel. Let's say I'm flying out west, I'm playing three cities in four nights. By the time I get to that third city, if I'm tired, if I'm exhausted, if I don't want to party, it doesn't matter. The people there, they've hired you, they've flown you out, they're paying you, you're the headliner, you got to show up. You, they the want, show must go on. The show must go on. There's, there's people there, it's the, twice a year they go out, there's people there that have hired babysitters, there's people there that this is a really big deal, it's someone's birthday. So the whole 
the whole environment, and you really are, you, you know, that, that saying you are the, the five people you spend the most time with, but that whole environment encourages poor sleeping, poor eating, poor drinking drug habits, terrible, it just, it's not, it's not a healthy, sustainable thing. Um, and it, it, from that point where my daughter, you know, was like, oh, KK Papa, when I felt like, a, you know, a bag of shit for being a, a terrible person, um, a couple years later, I found myself where my marriage was falling apart. I didn't know who I was. I felt like I was totally incongruent. Still, still, from, uh, still in the scene. Still in the scene. But that was, that was really it. I, was, I, I realized I was playing music I didn't like to enter peop, entertain people who I didn't, didn't care like. about <laughs> uh, for money. Yeah. Because EDM blew up. And then it was before maybe I'd, I'd go play in a city and I could play on a Thursday and get paid X amount of dollars. But now the music was blowing up and all of a sudden I could go play the same city, play on Saturday, play the big club, get triple my fee. However, most of the crowd there doesn't care. A bunch of people there are just wanting to look good. Um, I have to play crap I don't like. Yeah, it, so, became, it went from the party to the festival. Yeah, so it, that was definitely it. But I think I, mean, I hit a point where I was, I was suicidal. I was, I was so unhappy with who I was and so ashamed and so miserable. And I looked at the tatters, the remnants of my marriage and feeling like I was a bad father and um, it was a dark, dark place where I felt like I had to kind of reevaluate. I talk about identities a lot with people, about we kind of, there's, we have identities. We believe ourselves to be smart, to be likable, to be lazy, to be whatever. Our parents projected stuff on us. We were rewarded for things. Teachers said things, partners, whatever. And you collect all these labels, these identities, and you, you always live up or live down to them because it's really hard for us to be incongruent with that. And I just realized that I, did, I didn't know who I was anymore. I didn't like who I was anymore. Um, and it was a huge, like, me shedding all of that and starting fresh. It was hard. I'm sure it was. The toughest part of my life, definitely, that period. How long did it take? <sighs> like, there was probably six months where I cried every day. And were you, were you ever diagnosed as depressed, or um, no. did you describe yourself? Uh, like, you know, you hear a lot of people talking about anxiety now. Right, which you know, I want to kick them because, <laughs> you know, anxiety is stress, and stress can be good. Too much stress could be bad. But you know, I think people tend to throw out the word. And like, you know, here I listen to your story, and I'm like, if anyone should be anxious, it's that type of experience. So, but you know, what I also hear you saying is, you don't get to build up to who you are without being broken down to that level in some regards. And it's once you're broken down, it's then where do you go? Do we do we climb out of this hole? Do we start to you know? inch by inch move forward and keep going and hopefully get some momentum or do we give up? Yeah, and those are the moments. Those are the real moments. And that's why in, when you're in it and you're in the fog and you're in the hole, it's, it's so daunting and difficult and dark. But if you can get yourself out of it looking back, it's such a beautiful lesson and so much growth comes from that. Um, yeah, it's the same thing. I was laid off from a job three years ago. It was really tough. It was difficult. It, Super, the, the second most difficult part of my adult life, for sure. But looking back now, I wouldn't be where I am now without that. And I'm really grateful for that experience. But for a few months there, it was hairy and it was tough. And but three years ago, while it might have been hairy and tough, were you able to emotionally handle it differently? Yes. And, okay, so, you had already, uh, so, so by that stage in your life and by this point, you had already put enough work and balance into your own self that when you did hit that... Call it, we call it a rupture, we call it you know, an event, a trigger event, we could call it a moment in time, whatever, right? Shitty time, COVID, whatever. Uh, you're a little more resilient in the ability to, to, to keep pushing through. Very cool. So, all right, so you fall ass backwards into this HR role, uh, tech company, which is, was it a tech company? Yeah, the last two places that were were, were technology companies. Well, which I think is right up your alley in the sense that, you know, you're a uh, producer, you're a DJ, a musician, I'm sure you're pretty techy, right? An early adopter of technology, people culture are right up your alley, you're starting to find the, the, the passion for it, which is, uh, if I'll paraphrase, your, your, your observance of seeing the importance of working people to their best, helping them level up in all months. Awesome. How long was that stint for you in your, uh, in your career? Five years. So I did, uh, uh, yeah, two and a half years at one place, two and a half years at another. Um, yeah, long enough for me to, and you're talking about, you know, being right up my alley because, you know, I'm comfortable with technology and all those things. I think the other part that really spoke to me is those environments tend to encourage entrepreneurial type thinking. The roll up your sleeves, 
just do what needs to do, iterate with whatever, things go wrong, so what, how we're we gonna learn from this, like it's very much all hands on deck, kind of versus the other places which are, you know, where you might hear someone say, that's not in my job description, it's just right. that kind of thinking doesn't fly there, which really spoke to my entrepreneurial heart. Um, yeah, so five years I did in those kinds of places, and I, I definitely found myself gravitating more and more towards how can I do more people development, how can I do more coaching, how can I do more mentoring, how can I do more training. And now you got exposed to the world of thought leadership, the knowledge industry, and you said you got to learn, you got to start to do courses, and you didn't, I didn't go to university either, I actually dropped out of school, but it was only later in my life when I was being exposed into this industry that that's when I really started to learn, that's when I you know, went and started doing these different courses with intention and purpose. I, you know, I started reading and developing, etc. Uh, what were some of the main courses or books or TED Talks or YouTube videos or online programs that made an impact on you in your life? That maybe you would contribute part of your success today in thinking and mindset to that program that you did that taught you this. Anything come to mind? Yeah, a few things come to mind. There's an old cassette tape series by Tony Robbins, Ultimate Power. I think I have it in the office here somewhere. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so at, at one of those junctures, um, when I was deciding whether I was going to go back to work or what I was going to do with music before, my big breakdown, but a few years before that I had a, like a mini version of that where I was questioning who I was, I got a copy of those cassettes and I listened to them and I actually did the work and I was really intentional and like everything else, there's knowledge like heard and knowledge applied. There's definitely a big difference, and I actually applied it. So that was massive. Wayne Dyer's Your Erroneous Zones. I, I, it's probably one of the books I've He's like the grandfather of like this industry. Oh. Right? So that was a huge uh, thing for me. I looked at it, and I was like, oh, there's some very simple, applicable tools. It's not as complicated as I think it is. And I was very quickly able to take that and then go back and start applying it to what I was doing in the office. Um, and then mentors, really. I had this amazing mentor when I was at Click, Sue Easby, who is a really great people leader and trainer, and she's got I have 30 years of experience in, in the learning and development space and a lot of leadership experience. She was quite impactful. And then a couple of the business mentors last year were really big too. So, How important is mentorship? Incredibly important if you want to save yourself a bunch of unnecessary face plants and pitfalls and but isn't it about those face plants and pitfalls and, you know, falls that, you know, it's not to say that you don't want that mentorship, but isn't that an important part of the learning, important part of the growth, and without that, you're, you're, you're sort of being robbed from that, that, that yes. experience? Yes, awesome. That was a great call out. You know, because what it is, is you still need those, and a really good coach or mentor, whoever's guiding you, will let you have the face plants, yeah. but it's just them being there for when you start to pull yourself back up, and that's... That's the help that's needed. And that sometimes that's the difference maker between whether you climb out of the hole or you get stuck in the hole right. or how long you stay in the hole. It's okay to, to reach for the hand, yeah. stretching down to pull yes. you up. Totally, yeah. because you also have to reach for that hand. Yes, right? you have to do your They're part. They're not picking you up. You, yeah. you, you're, you, it's, it's a 50-50 pull, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, the second question I was going to ask. Do you think or are people... Um, how do I describe this? leaning into this world of mentorship in the wrong way. In other words, they think that's the answer. If I get a mentor, I'm off like a rocket ship. Uh, that's all I need to do. I don't need to go through the pits and falls. I don't need to go through the hard work, et cetera, et cetera. It's the magic pill. That's the magic pill thinking, which is false in any, whether it's a mentor, whether it's signing up for an online course, whether it's, and that's pursuing the external thing and thinking that external thing is going to solve it. Uh, this, it's honestly, it makes me think of the, the I'll be happy when approach, I'll be successful when approach. Uh, but no, you still need to, you just said it, you still need to reach up, you still need to do the work, you still need to do some inner reflection, you still need to make some screw ups and learn from them. So yeah, there's no, there's no instant fix it, get rich quick, solve all the problems. Right. It's a tool. A mentor is a tool, right. uh, a helper like anything else, and you have to use it and apply it. And I want to come back to something that you said. You said even though you did that first Tony Robbins course, the main thing that you did was you operated with intention and application. You did the work. So you, you listened to the tape. You then filled out the worksheet. You then defined your goals. You wrote them on the board. You, you did the daily practices. You did the next tape. You did the homework. But the key thing that I heard you say, you may, I might have not used this words, but you practiced. 
Absolutely. Right? I'm a big believer in practicing. And, you know, I, I say to, in fact, I just finished recording our online program, and one of the key things I said in the program, I said, yeah, now you've got the program, like, you can watch it any time, but that's not going to help. What's going to help is you go and practice. Just practice this every day. Practice that today. Practice that tomorrow. Practice that the day after. And if you just keep practicing, eventually you just might get good. Yes. And even when you're good, you want to keep practicing so that... It, I, I love this, and I love that you, you pulled out that word, that teased out that word, because whether we look at sports analogies, which is a very common analogy that's used when talking about growth and success and, and you know, hitting goals or whatever, because the best athletes still practice every week, week in, week out, month in, month out. And another way that it's kind of come to light to me is meditation is really popular, yoga is really popular, we've seen those things really grow in the last five, ten years. People talk about those as practice. Your meditation practice, your yoga practice, and knowing that every day you've got to show up, and every day is going to be different, and you've got to put in the work every day. You're right. It's a constant practice. You're right. You're absolutely right. You never, you, you never hear someone say, I do yoga. They say, I practice yoga. I practice yoga. You never hear someone say, so, you know, uh, I'm a meditator. So I practice meditation. I practice breathing. I practice communication. I practice interpersonal skills. Very cool. Okay, so you're in your te uh, tech company. You shared the name earlier. I don't know if you meant to do so, but like a very cool tech company to uh, be a part of and cut your teeth with. Um, uh, and then you find yourself going through this experience of HR, people culture, coaching, thought leadership, leadership development, schooling, the whole sort of nine. And you say, fuck it, I'm out. I'm out. I'm going to take the leap of faith. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to step into the abyss right now. I'm going to step off the ledge. And we'll see. Hopefully the fall won't be like, a, like a, this trench. Hopefully it'll be just, uh, just a little step. What was that? Here's an interesting question. So you quit, and obviously you transition out. I don't think you just walked out. I have a really good story here. Okay, so go. a year ago, I wrote a post-it note that said, quit my job by December 10th. It was an arbitrary date. December 10th is my birthday. It was far enough out that I was able to create some belief that I could actually do it. And then I took regular action and steps towards getting to it. And then I announced that I was leaving my job at the end of November and I posted a video on LinkedIn about it and I was very loud and vocal about like owning this new thing I was stepping into. It wasn't meek. I was like, I'm doing this. That announcement and that launch went so well that I was flooded with leads and I was flooded with clients. And within a week I was coaching someone in the UK and I had clients here and I had clients in the US. It, it hit really quick. And when I had told my job in November I'm quitting, I said, I'm quitting in January. It's a couple months out. You'll have time to back from my role. I know that as the director of people and culture here, I'm the only HR person. It's really important. I'm on a leadership team. You're going to have enough time to do it. And I was like, mm, I didn't meet my December 10th date, but January is not bad. I'm good with it. But then when things blew up, I realized, because I was getting up at 6 in the morning, doing work, doing coaching calls in the office at lunchtime and I was burning out really quick and I, my choices were either lose out on business as I was launching my, my company or burn out. And so then I went back to the bo my boss and said, eh, I know I said January, I actually have to go in two weeks. And the date that I ended up leaving was December 6th. So oh, four wow. days before the date so I put the post, goal. I met my goal. Right, you even beat the goal. I beat the goal. Right, yeah, that's amazing. And, and you know, I think a lot of people make this mistake where they, they have one foot in each sandbox, right? They're, they're not committed. You know, I, I often push back, you know, I, I, with people also in the coaching world where, you know, they, are, they all want the fucking quick answer. Like, you know, just tell me what, and I, I just want to say, here's the quick answer to all of this. Pick a path and go, right? Make the decision and move, right? Decide that this is what you're going to do and then do it. None of this shit's hard. The hard stuff is the, the step, which I think we all get knocked by. And then, of course, the mentorship and the guiding that you're going along the right path and you're moving at the right pace and you're moving in the right direction, right, in light of new information. So you're flooded with clients, you quit in two weeks. This is now, what, December 6th. You're about to move into the holiday season. What's that, Jan, for us look like for you? This is incredible. It's so, so great. I, I felt so free and so liberated. I haven't woken up to an alarm clock in seven months. Like there's, and I'm Do you still wake up at the same time every day? Yeah, I wake up at the same time every day. I go what to time? bed uh, six-ish, 
Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, 6 yeah. to 6.15. Like he said 10, no. 9.45. We're no, like, no. bro, you missed the point. You, no. you got to go back to the cassettes. Yeah. Right? No, no, I'm yeah. getting up early. I'm totally Good. getting up early. And I think you said something that stood out to me. You talked about people want to be one foot in, one foot out. Yeah. On Shark's Tank or on Dragon's Den, when the investors are considering to invest in someone, a question they often ask is, are you still working somewhere? And they're trying to measure how all in are you. Yeah. What's the commitment level? You know, are you doing? Are you taking the Viking approach where you're burning the boats? Are you really giving it your all? Um, and that's the approach I took. So yeah, when I woke up January first, it was great. My partner and I, the night before, we did like a an exercise where we reflected on the entire year. What did we enjoy this year? What did we learn? What did we grow? What did we wish we did better? We went out for a nice dinner. We went to bed at a reasonable time. I got up, not hungover, full of energy, excited and feeling kind of the master of my universe as far as what was in front of me. Very cool. Does she practice a lot of the same stuff you practice? Uh, some, yes. Enough that we, one of the best things we did, actually, you asked earlier, what are some of the most impactful things I did? There is a weekend, it's labeled as a leadership course, but it's really about a, it's a group therapy session, really. Sometimes I jokingly call it crying with strangers. It's called Seeds Leadership. It is some of the most impactful personal work I've ever done. Her and I went and did that as a couple. Um, so as far as really taking our relationship to the next level and giving us shared language and terms to use when we're stuck on something or when there's friction, um, insane, like just insane as far as leveling up our relationship. So she, she's into it. She reads a lot of the same stuff. She believes in it. Um, she's my editor. She's, I soundboard with her a lot. And we are different enough that we complement each other, which is awesome. Very cool. Very cool. Okay. So... Talk to me, uh, move me into your coaching, uh, your coaching practice. Mm -hmm. um, what's your concepts? What is your theory? What do you do? So, How do you do it? <laughs> the, when I describe what I do, I often talk about three main buckets, and I'll go in details after. The main bucket is to help people get really clear on what the hell it is they actually want. What is it that they want? Ensure that it lines up with their values and what's important to them. Set those goals Two, help them create the unshakable belief that not only can they, they can do it, but they actually deserve it. Because that, point, that piece is so important before we move on to the last part, which is the strategies, the tactics, the operations, the delivery. Because I can tell you all about you know, picking your niche and about showing up powerfully online and what marketing on LinkedIn looks like and whatever, whatever, whatever. But if you don't believe that you deserve it, if you don't think you're good enough, if you're lacking the self-worth, the tactics and strategies, they don't stick. It, it really, it's really, like the inner piece is so damn important. So it's, those are the, the three things I do. I tend to work, I, I work all with entrepreneurs. And again, that's me just kind of paying attention. I launched my business. I didn't say I worked with entrepreneurs, but I paid attention to who showed up. And beginning of January, I was like, oh, everyone minus one person is an entrepreneur. Why is that? What is it I love about entrepreneurs? I love that they are uh, action driven, that they aren't afraid of failure, that they're willing to get messy and roll up their sleeves, that they're carving their own path. I identify with that. I've been an entrepreneur, so I declared that as that's who I work with. Um, yeah. Would you work with corporate? Like, would you go back into the corporate world of coaching, or would you stick it out with entrepreneurs? I'd stick it out. It's, I definitely, when COVID hit, I had my own whiteboard session where I, like, who am I working with? Why am I working with them? What can I do? How's this affecting my business? And I did re-entertain that. I actually turned someone down a month ago who someone I know, I love and respect, and I've got a relationship with this person, and they wanted leadership style training, which would fit more the model of what you deliver in a corporate environment. Mm -hmm. and, and I said no, and it was several thousand dollars, yeah. but it's just, it's not, it's, it's, not it's not my thing. It's not gonna be, it's gonna feel like a job. The greatest thing a coach or a uh, leadership training company or Training company stuff that I and you do is be is is be willing to turn down the gig, right? Because early in your career you take it all on, and you butcher it, and that's part of falling down. I'm just glad I fell down like very early in like the 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 late '90s and 2000s with this industry. Considering back then there was no social media, it, it was a little bit more of a newspaper ad that you used to run, etc. But would you work with a entrepreneurial corporate company? Possibly. Um, I've got one of my clients right now is two partners that have a partnership. They're looking to build a company and grow. It's an interesting gig because there's the dynamics of two people, which is uh, really fascinating and it's different than the one-on-one -on -one work. Uh, but there is joint calls with them where we can talk about certain things, but 
they're, when I have individual calls with them, we can go to greater depths. Um, so it's a little bit of that. I don't know. Um, I would potentially work with a, an entrepreneur, like a, a company, an entrepreneurial company, but again, I, I, I prefer, I think, working with individuals. Um, Dude, you're a purist, man, which is impressive, which is like, I know what I do, I know who I do it well with, and this is the type of work I want to be doing. That's, that's really impressive. It's hard for people to be so assertive and, and, and certain with that because it requires risk. It requires you to have, you know, that, call it guts, to be like, yeah, I'm going to say no to shit, even when maybe sometimes it doesn't feel right. Impressive. Okay, talk to me about mindset, interpersonal skills, soft skills, inner work versus strategy and tactics. That's what we're saying what your buckets were. Yeah. Um, walk me through some of what your thoughts are or best practices for mindset and interpersonal skills. Would I throw you off if I want to go back and add a point to the last thing you just said? Of course, go. Let's go. It feels inherently like a risk. And you're talking about, and thank you, you're saying really nice things, and I'm a purist, I'm willing to say no. And I, I, what I've realized is that that is a key to succeed in this world. One of the incredible things, the way that you and I are sitting across from each other is because of social media. I saw you on social media, message, we chatted, realized we have some friends in common, we're able to connect. It's incredible. We are literally connected to millions of people on all of these platforms. And you can have clients in multiple places. You're going online now. So instead of you having to have your old model where it was bum in seats, you are going to be helping people around the world. Right. I have clients in different countries. That is magic. The right. downside is it's really noisy. It's super noisy. And how the hell do you stand out when there are thousands of coaches and thousands of leadership companies? It's a saturated thousands, market. It's, it's so saturated. The way you stand out is to get really crystal clear on who you are serving and why you are serving them and talk from that place. So when I'm talking from the place of being an entrepreneur, about the problems that entrepreneurs face, about the kinds of things that I love helping people with, then that is magnetic to the kind of people I work with and it helps me really stand out and it helps cut through the noise. So it's actually intentional. And while it seems risky, and it's an interesting thing that I talk with some of my, my entrepreneurs about and some of the people I'm helping them build their business where they're like, oh, but I don't want to say no to business. If you're willing to say no, it's a very short-term risk for the longer-term reward in this noisy, online, millions of people connected market. You're right. You're absolutely right. You're almost describing the, call it, 2020 version of the book called The Blue Ocean Strategy. You know, the Blue Ocean Strategy, right? Which is how do you carve out your blue ocean? So, you know, tech companies were sort of birthed or like, you know, things like Uber are, are that blue ocean. But I kind of hear a little bit of that sort of uh, uh, similarity or there's a link there, which is in order to cut through the noise in this ocean, which is noisy, right, you've got to be very direct and pure in who you are. It's cool, man. Very fucking cool. So, I mean, any advice you would, and this is just for the coaches out there, any advice that you would give a coach of what not to do? Any, any, any big sort of like, hey, this would be the one thing I would tell all coaches to either live by or not, like, think about. A couple things come to mind right away and kind of going off of the point I was just making about uh, being willing to niche and being willing to, to choose a specific market you're serving, but more importantly, align on values, align on what's important to you, align on psychometrics. Uh, and that is an incredible way to differentiate yourself and really kind of stand out. That would be one really big piece of advice. Um, the other one is people get stuck in the playing business thing. I jokingly call playing business, uh, making really pretty websites, beautiful business cards, the logo that they paid thousands of dollars for and all these things, but they're not, they don't have paying clients. They, they aren't coaching anyone. They're not working with anyone and it's focusing on the wrong things. So it's, you're busy, but are you being productive? Um, are you really, you know, are you moving towards what is truly important? So just that, and then, I don't, you can make shit up. I think people get really stuck up. What stops people from taking action is they try and wait for it to be perfect. And if you hold your big goals loosely, so my big goal was I want to help people and I want to help people become better versions of themselves. I want to help people uh, feel strong, feel empowered. I want to help people, whatever. It doesn't, like you can put different labels. At first, I initially thought I was going to be a creativity coach. I have this creative background, I love music, I love artists, I have all these different ways I know how to help people be more creative, not on demand, but more consistently. And that's what I thought I was going to do. But then I had people showing up and asking me about my habits, because I was posting a lot on Instagram about my habits, about my morning routine, about my dedication to this, and people were saying, I want to do that, help me do that. And I was like, okay, I pause. I know how to do this, I enjoy doing this, it helps me, it's going to help me help other people become better versions of themselves. 
I will have to do this. So I did that. And then I did this for a bit. And then I mentioned earlier that I realized at some point, oh, wait a minute, all my clients but one are entrepreneurs. So I said, okay, I'm an entrepreneur coach that helps people be more consistent by focusing and creating habits at last. And then I had some coaches show up. And I had, because I succeeded, because I out of the gate, I had paying clients, I was doing well, whatever. And it yeah, seemed like. Yeah, a, yeah, you're the rare. Most of these online coaches don't make it. It's like a restaurant, right? Yeah. Like most restaurants don't make it. So people showed up and they were asking, like, how'd you do this? Tell me about it, whatever. And I had a couple people ask me if I coach coaches. The first two people I said no. When the third person asked me in 10 days if I coach coaches, I was like, yeah, yeah, I yes, I do. And in my mind, I'm like, as of three seconds ago, <laughs> this is now something I do. Right. Um, and the good news is now you got three leads. Well, Two from a week ago no, and, and one no, from today. Not, <laughs> so being willing to hold the big goals loosely and just not be so stuck on the, what things have to look like or how they unfold has allowed me a big part of my success. And I think, so it, you can make stuff up. Like I was a habits coach for a while and then I was an entrepreneur coach and now I'm kind of blending the two. I work with entrepreneurs, ambitious entrepreneurs, and purpose-driven coaches to help them launch and scale businesses consistently and with confidence, I think is my current tagline on LinkedIn. Um, you can make shit up is the point I'm saying to it, and just be open to the evolving possibilities. So you, you mentioned habits. You're, 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 pretty, you're pretty focused and strong on your habits. What are some of your habits, your daily habits? I have a morning sequence that my partner lovingly calls my boot-up sequence. My boot up sequence. Wait, is this also part of the reboot program? It is part of the reboot okay. program. So uh, my boot up sequence is I have a cold shower. I do stretches and exercises, pull ups, crunches, sit ups, etc. Then I meditate and then I journal. And they're all intentionally and they're in that order. The cold shower, it slaps me awake. It's like my coffee. It's instant awake. It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. So I'm doing something awkward and comfortable every single day. And it's and I, there's still to this day there's always a hesitation. I'm like, Ugh. but and I do it and I push through that awkwardness. So it's a really great way to start my day. Uh, the stretches and exercises. I don't think I need to explain why that's a good thing and why that's a great way to start the day. Um, and then the meditation. It's like I'm clearing my mind. I'm getting focused on what's important. Ideas come to me. And when I'm done those three things, normally I have a bunch of stuff in my head, and I don't have necessarily any structure to my journaling. It's just my commitment is I sit down with the pages and I just write. Sometimes it's things I'm happy about, some things it's to do, sometimes I'm complaining, sometimes I'm, I'm coaching myself almost because almost, there's almost like a soundboard. Mm -hmm. I, I get ideas out and I look, I'm like, oh, I'm thinking this and then I can do something about it. So that's something that I do regularly every single day. And then um, at night I always have a really hot shower, which is there like a reward after the end of the day? Yeah, it's but it's also, there's a lot of physiology with that, which is like what it does for your body, the, the cold versus the hot. Right, it's like a cold plunge pool, and then you get in the sauna kind of thing. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, it's okay. great. It puts me in a sleepy state, and then um, I read pretty much every single night. So those are some things that I, I hold to, and uh, no matter what, those are things that I'm doing. So since you say you read every night, what's, your, what's the kind of book next to your uh, bed on what they call the nightstand? On the nightstand, mm -hmm. which is funny because uh, I think the Mary Kondo craze about simplifying your life, uh, I read somewhere the idea that you should only have I can't remember whether it was six books or ten books, and she was talking total, and I was like, uh, I have more than that beside my bed currently. <laughs> so what are some of the books that you got next to your bed? Some of the books I'm currently reading, I'm rereading Atomic yeah. Habits by James yeah. Clear. It's a, such a good book, and I think it's a good kind of book I'll probably reread once a year, realistically. Um, I've picked back up Jack Canfield's Success Principles, which is a really thick, incredible, juicy book um how important oh, uh, how important is focus and what do you think is disrupting our ability to focus on these daily habits these practices the goals what 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 i was going to say fucks us up but i'll say it anyway <laughs> <laughs> um so one focus is incredibly important there is a really great story that i love about warren buffett and bill gates and it was the second time that they were ever hanging out, and they didn't really know each other, and they were with a group. And the person leading the group asked everyone to write down what is the key to their success, and unknowingly they both wrote the word focus. So, and you, I don't know that there's many people that have hit that level of success, not just financially, but also with the philanthropy and the work they do, it's incredible. Um, but then also watching the Beyonce Netflix documentary about her, home, it's called Homecoming, I think, her lead up to the Coachella, performance, yep. mind-boggling. Yep. 
that woman is so fucking focused. It is unbelievable. Day in and day out and pushing. And uh, so it, there is there's plenty of clues there. The idea that, you know, if we were walking outside of your office here and the idea was to uh, get up to, what's that? Is that York Mills up there? Yeah, what, York yeah, Mills, yeah. York, York Mills. The difference between if we just walked straight in that direction versus if we, I took two steps that way, yeah. then turned and took two steps this way, yeah. then turned around and took it's two steps analogy. that way. And this way, and you're not going to get anywhere. So definitely, it, you have to. And I think that's an unfortunate thing too, is that people are really quick to try something and do something. Back to the idea you mentioned earlier, having one foot in, in two, three different things, not really focused on anything, and then wonder why there's not results. And you, you're, you're setting me up for this question too, because you know I'm really passionate about this, something that gets in our way, and as you mentioned, fucks us up, is cell phones, is the distraction. And we're similar ages, and we remember pre-internet, I remember no smell f cell phones, I remember no smartphones, but if you're not smart with this, it will interrupt you every 30 seconds, every two minutes, nonstop, all day. Uh, there's plenty of people that are living a life where the first thing they do in the morning, when they're half awake, they're reaching for their phone. This idea that there's this whole generation that the phone is within, actually most people now, their phone is within one or two arms like, all day. Right. All day. There's, and there's, younger people are sleeping with it under the pillow. I've heard the stats. I'm like, what? I think you told me 80 or 85 percent of kids are sleep, or across some of the younger generations that have those cell phones, are sleeping with it under their pillow. That's mind blowing. I grew up in a generation in a country that you slept with a gun under your pillow, <laughs> <laughs> but a phone. And you would think how dangerous a gun would be under your pillow as the joke, right? Yeah. But a phone, like you just, just all that electricity going into your brain just can't be good for it. Well, and then you're, just, you're living kind of the life of this dictator, which is this little devices. If the first thing you're doing every morning is checking your phone to see what notifications you got, what messages you got, what's being asked, if you have anyone liked your post, and the last thing you're doing every day is checking your phone to see if there's any new emails or whatever, and in between those two events, you're checking your phone literally hundreds of times a day, which is the reality for most people, there's no focus work, there's no creative work, there's no, and then plus, it's, it's fake. It's, everyone's posting highlights. It's a highlight reel. No one's, people are rarely talking about the struggles and the things that aren't going well and what's going on. So you're being interrupted. It's running your day. And you're comparing yourself to a false narrative. It's terrible. I, yeah, it's, yeah. Simon Sinek talks a lot about it. And, you know, he talks about how sometimes when him and his friends, their social friends, go out for dinner, what they'll do is they'll all leave their cell phones uh, at home, except one person will bring a cell phone just in case there's an emergency, or like, oh, there's one person. Where does your phone live in your house? And well, what what are my remedies for it? So my yeah. phone, I I am susceptible, just like everyone else. But a couple things I do is there's a place near the entrance where my wallet and keys live. My phone is there a lot. Okay. Um, at night, the phone is either not in the bedroom or it's on the other side of the room on a dresser. Cool. So I'd have to actually get up and walk across the room to get it. And I regularly go on airplane mode. Mm -hmm. Several times a week, I'll turn my phone on airplane mode. I'll text my partner, hey, honey, I'm going to be unavailable for the next three hours, four hours, or whatever. And I turn it off. Um, I have eliminated almost all notifications from my home screen. So the note, like I don't get Instagram notifications. I don't even get email notifications. I get text message notifications is the only thing that comes to my home screen. It's the only notification I get yeah. is text message. That's it. I've, always, I've never had my notifications turned on. And I always keep my phone in silent. Yeah, me too. So those are, are huge things. And then on top of that, I'll use website blockers like Block Site. And there's different things where, you know, every possible distracting site is on a block. My cell phone's on airplane mode. And then I can actually do work because for a bunch of work these days, you still need to be online. You still need to be on some online sure. thing. But those are some of my, my remedies and approaches for sure. Awesome. Very smart. Simple too, man. Really simple. Okay. Uh, Rob G in the house, you're amazing. Thank you so much for being here. The last thing I want to talk to you about is your reboot program. Just run me through it. This is sort of what your your uh, sort of model is for coaching and 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 uh, the program you're offering to clients. Give us an overview of what it is. What do people get? Yes. And uh, why should they do it? it? So reboot is actually a new thing that I am launching currently, and it is taking all of my most impactful coaching lessons and tools and approaches that I do with my one-on-one -on -one clients and offering in a group coaching atmosphere. Uh, I'm launching it with a case study group mid-July, uh, eight people only. I've got four people signed up right now. And it's really 
the upfront stuff earlier when I was talking about, you know, you need to get these things in order before you can even get to tactics and strategies. It's helping you get really clear on what's important to you, what your values are, uh, for you to build habits, to get focus, for you to own and understand your worth. Because a lot of people don't realize and understand and own their worth. Uh, helping people with the mindset around confidence and to get the little voice in your head cheering for you versus just knocking you down all the time. And then helping people set really bold, audacious goals. And, and then lastly, how do you create courage to take action? Because as you know, you can, if you have goals but you're not taking action, then there's no point. So that's the, the high level overview of the program. And it's really, again, me paying attention to what's going on. COVID has meant that there's been this grand pause, which meant that you know, busyness, which is the probably most celebrated coping mechanism has been put on hold. You, the, the gym's closed, the bar's closed, you can't go socialize with people. Like, you were working from home. It's just like everything was stopped, which meant that millions of people were forced to kind of rethink and reevaluate what life means to them, what the relationships mean to them, if they're happy with work, people have been laid off. And I was getting a lot of these kinds of questions, which to me are more like life 101 or coaching 101, so, which is normally a part of what I work with with my entrepreneurs. And I've just put that into a little course. So doing a, a, a cool. test with these eight people in two weeks, and then that'll be something that I'll be offering ongoing going forward. Awesome. Is it online or it's, is it going to be live it's, it's, it's a combo. So there's online videos and modules for you to do. Okay. And then there's a, a weekly check-in call. With the eight people. With the eight people. Okay. So you do your online learning, you apply, apply, and then you come together as a group once a week. Yes. Very cool model. And you're looking for four more people? Four more people. Awesome. So we'll post this. Uh, hopefully we'll get it out before the next two weeks. But if you want a spot in Rob G's uh, upcoming program, Reboot, there's four seats available. We'll get to all your information below so people can uh, hopefully reach out. And if not, on at least this round, maybe next time, yes. they'll come and sign up for it and yes, pay right. for it instead of just participate through a case study. Well, it's a, it, I'm still charging for it. It's just it's a very favorable price for the case study. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 427 US. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Awesome. I think people spend more, more on that on Amazon today than, uh, <laughs> uh, than anything else. You know it. Okay, cool. Rob G., you're the man. Thank you so much Thank for you being for here. Me. We are going to most likely have you back. It was a good conversation. I think um, some of the things that you shared, just not only about your own experience, but some of your habits, I think was, was really uh, powerful and, and simple. And thank you, man, because guys like you are the people that are going to contribute to this world being a better place. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. It's awesome. And yeah, it feels like I'm hanging out with an old friend. So. Right, right, right. Well, we'll hang out more. All right. Awesome. All right. If you like today's episode, don't forget to click like, subscribe. If you want to leave a comment down below, that would be amazing. And if you want to give us a five-star rating, that always helps us on uh, the platforms like Spotify and Apple and YouTube and all that good stuff. Until next time, goodbye. Hey, I'm Greg Witz. Thanks so much for coming and checking out the video. If you like that video, you're going to love the the next one so I'd highly suggest that you click this video over here and don't forget to subscribe and share.